there's a story about a man who was walking through this place where a cathedral was being built. And he talked to one of the workers and said, what do you do here? And the man responds, well, I am making bricks from clay and straw and all these things. And he goes to the person next to him and says, hey, what are you doing? He says, well, I take the bricks from this pile and I stack them in a row and that's my job. And then he goes to the third person and asks them, hey, what are you doing here? And he says, oh, I'm building a cathedral. And that's kind of the moment when I think your team can understand what's going on and really unlock their creativity is when you don't just understand what's on your plate this week, you don't just understand what's in front of you, but you understand the long-term vision that you are you connect with and that you're proud of and that is crystal clear. And that's going to motivate and make you feel like an owner in a way that if you just understand, oh, my job is to hand over you know a spec to the engineer so that we can hit this launch milestone so that we can hit our goal. You know, that's not actually the total point, right? The goal is to have this thing that you can latch onto and understand completely and that connects with you. Welcome to Growth Mates, the place to connect with inspiring leaders to help you grow yourself and your product. Here you can learn how companies like Dropbox, Adobe, Amplitude, Canva, and many more are building excellent products and growth culture. Please press follow to support us and get new episodes. This time we talk to Matt Woods, a product manager focused on product-led growth, who helped companies like Coda increase key activation metrics by 60%, introduce personalization experience that combines great UX and business impact. Matt also contributed to Reforge Artifacts to share examples of his work as one of the earliest contributors to their program. Being a product manager, Matt has a fantastic website built with Coda, full of insightful case studies. I personally learned so much from Matt, and if you listen to this episode, you will learn about the process of defining activation and aha moment with examples from Coda, how connection to customers help to uncover meaningful wins, the secrets behind collaboration between product managers and designers in growth, and much more. If you find our show valuable, please share it with your colleagues and friends. To receive all episodes right in your inbox, subscribe to katesuma.substack.com. Your support means a lot. This episode is brought to you by AppQs, the platform that helps you design, deploy, and test captivating onboarding experiences in minutes, not weeks. AppQs created the Product Adoption Academy, which includes courses, templates, and examples to help you level up your product adoption, and you can use it entirely for free. Check out the five-step growth flow review template, which I created to help companies connect growth hypotheses with behavioral patterns to uncover meaningful improvements. Find an example of Dropbox onboarding inside and use this template to review any growth flows in your product. Get the template for the link appcuse.com slash growthmates appcuse.com slash growthmates I have one exciting announcement for you. If you are keen on mastering product growth and activation, join the upcoming course with me in April. User onboarding is the base for product growth. On the user side, it helps get value faster. On the business side, activated users have four times bigger conversion to pay. With my co-author, we worked on user onboarding at Mira for more than five years, helped over 10 companies to improve their user onboarding, analyzed 100 onboarding flows, and last year created an onboarding report that over 2,000 people found useful. On the course, we are going to empower you with all knowledge and experience we have to help you create a great onboarding experience for your product. For dear listeners of GrowthMates, we provide a special 10% discount till the end of March and a 15% discount for teams. Find the link in the episode description. Hello, everybody, and hello, Matt. How are you doing today? Hey, fantastic. Super excited to hop on and talk with you and Cade. Yeah, where are you calling us from? I am currently based in Denver, Colorado, uh, which is great. I've been here for a few years, moved during the pandemic for the nature and all the weird stuff happening in the city, and it's been a great time so far. Yeah, cool. With us is also Kate, co-host of the podcast. How are you today? 
Welcome to Growth Mates, everyone. I'm doing great. I just recorded another podcast as a guest. I was happy to be on the other side and now have this uh, fantastic conversation with Matt. Excited about that. So Matt is a product manager and I've just wow. been checking and digging into your website, which is quite cool. And it's created with Coda, I saw. I didn't even know that you could create websites mm. with Coda, but yours look very cool. So what was your intention behind creating this website on, on first place? Oh, absolutely. So <laughs> the main reason was just to force myself to share some of the things I'd been working on. A lot of my design partners I've worked with, these breathtaking portfolios, and you can kind of like flip through it almost like a chapter of all the things they've done, all their proudest accomplishments. You can see them grow and you get a real sense for what it's like to work with them just by seeing the work. That was actually one of my favorite pieces of advice I got from Brian Balfour, who founded Reforge, worked at HubSpot, is like, just look at the work if you want to understand someone. But when I looked at myself, I realized I had a resume. It, if I talked to people you know, over coffee, I would start sharing examples and templates and, and different things that I was working on and different projects that I was excited and really proud to have shipped. But if you search for me online or if you were you know, trying to hire me or work with me or just curious, it was like a black hole. There was nothing. And so... I never felt like it was the top of my list. I put it on my to-do list. Hey, I'd like to have a goal. I'd like to publish portfolios. I'd like to have case studies. Maybe not as pretty as my design partners, but you know, something that people can look at and get a sense for what it's like to work with me and what I value and some of the things I've done. But it felt like I could never make time. So for me, I kind of put myself in situations where it was easier. I had to kind of share in small doses what I was doing. One of those was contributing to programs like Reforge Artifacts, which is just a place where you can share templates and bite-sized examples of your work. So I did some of that to kind of collect some of it um, and, and publish. I also volunteered to do different things around Coda. So I wrote a blog post about how I did a feedback system, which kind of doubled as content for my website. When we launched Custom Domains, which is one of the ways you can kind of publish a Coda doc and have it say, hey, mattwoods.io or, you know, portfolio at matwoods.io. I signed up for that to kind of force myself in an afternoon to put it all into a Coda doc kind of as a mini website and do that. And then the actual main website was um, when I was learning to code and I was teaching coding classes locally, I, I coded that website myself just to kind of stay close to tech and kind of stretch myself in different ways. So it's been a good little, you know, playground to share some of what I've been working on and hone my own skills too. Something that I hate about portfolios is that you put a lot of effort on them, at least me as a product designer. And then after one year or two, they are outdated and you need to put a lot of effort on them. And you kind of every three or four years, you're rebuilding the whole thing. But the good thing about this process is that every time you do it, you learn something about you and you kind of position it yourself in a, in a new way in the industry. And I wanted to ask you if this time building this website, there is anything that you learn about your mission as a result of creating this portfolio? Yeah, Oscar, that's true. I did. For me, it was the moment when I realized I needed to step back and go for a walk and do some thinking was when I was trying to write the headline or whatever is like on the main part of your portfolio. Because a lot of people have a great mission statement or what they're about or what they're most interested in or what they're most proud of. And when I went to go write that, I kind of drew a blank for the first time. And so, you know, I am a big believer in like writing to kind of crystallize your thoughts. And I think clear writing requires clear thinking. And so when I did sit down to write it and tweak it and polish it into something I was proud of, kind of what I landed on is that curiosity was one of my core values, both in terms of being able to understand how businesses grow, being able to understand my craft, being able to teach others who are also curious. And what's nice about curiosity is it's this kind of an ongoing journey. You never stop, you never arrive. But being able to document small sprints and, and kind of share that along the way, like in my website and other ways was really helpful. But it has been great to kind of be able to wear that on my sleeve and attract other curious people and, and share that, yeah, when things come up. Yeah, I love that you actually, you're leading by example in the, in the way uh, by creating this website, being a product manager. I think I haven't seen a lot of examples of product managers with websites. And I think your website is interesting in a way that it is quite practical and useful. It's not just 
beautiful pages. Sometimes design portfolios are just about beautiful digital design, but not about some meaningful examples. Uh, but you have these artifacts and you have all of them. And we will talk about them, of course, uh, today as well. But I want to say as well that I'm a huge fan of Quota as a product. I think what company is doing is great. It's like evangelizing the clear organization of files and evangelizing these use cases like non-designers can create these portfolios through platform. And I also remember we first met with you and with other folks from Coda on our shared session of like Mira and Coda people. That was very nice. And Coda is quite famous for its like user-friendly, intuitive experience, but also for product-led growth strategies that helped you land off, I suppose. And you worked at Coda as an activation product manager for more than two years, I think. And I really want to ask you, what do you think were the fundamentals that helped Coda become successful? Yeah. If I had to boil down one of my favorite things about Coda's culture and their leadership and the way they make decisions, it would be just this incredibly thoughtful and deliberate culture. One of the values that really stuck with me and like was transforming and how I think was this value of right over familiar. And kind of what they mean by that is a lot of times in SaaS or just when you're building a company or trying to make decisions, it's easy to look to your right and look to your left and say, well, oh, I'm, you know, building onboarding. What is Miro doing? You know, what is Notion doing? What is this <laughs> other, you know, peer kind of doing? And that's so incredibly human, right? But if you want average results, you know, kind of pulling from everyone else, you know, and kind of like pulling in the average of all the things you're taking in, it probably won't get you this incredible outlier result. And so one thing I really appreciate about Coda is the thoughtfulness they put into, yes, things internally like their company culture, but also their product decisions. Some of the things that they end up shipping across all elements of the experience from monetization to the actual building blocks and the product end up looking much different than if you were just kind of like let's just directly you know shipping a fire hose of what your users tell you or what you're seeing in the market one of the examples i like for this my current company doesn't use coda so i was using another product and kind of their call outs feature which is kind of where you can highlight some text and provide a little icon and have a little blurb of information or snippets and uh, a lot of products have like a pretty simple call out feature where, you know, you can maybe change the color a little bit, but it's kind of its own standalone thing. It's not very flexible. But I remember being in different, you know, sessions when we were designing the call out feature or like other people across my team were designing that feature. And the amount of time making sure it was composable, that it was easy to use, but it was also insanely powerful and that it worked with all the other building blocks we'd worked before was remarkable. And I end up missing it so much because I can't flex it as much. I can't put other building blocks inside it. I can't make it look exactly the way I want. And so the way that they strove for making it insanely easy to use, but also surprisingly powerful was amazing. And that also wasn't limited to just the core product experience. That was through things like how we charge for makers over all users, which encourages like sticky use and spread instead of just kind of, kind of your run of the mill billing. Or even the way that they strove to build platforms for publishing and for integrations that kind of produce this flywheel growth, which may not be the easy thing to do. It may not be the quick fix. It may not be the fastest time to ship, but the gains and kind of like the long-term vision that it was building towards was insanely powerful. And being in a culture that had space and really valued that was really powerful and changed the way I think about products in general. Wow, it's interesting. It feels like the philosophy behind that is like investing into differentiators and fundamentals first as big bets in order to stimulate future growth because if you don't invest into these bigger differentiators why your platform why coda should become ex exceptional on this definitely red ocean because you can be with like google docs and notion and i think a lot of products here is essential and is it something that is also in the root cause and the foundation of your culture at Coda and how as a product-led growth company in general teams should experiment right and you were an activation team that probably had to experiment a lot with the activation flows how did you find this balance like when to invest into these bigger things and bigger 
bad and when you could do some more optimizational iterative work as a growth team yeah it's always the struggle right because when you're shipping quick wins and you're you know kind of doing these faster things where you can maybe run an a b test and get a result in hours or days it feels really good or when you can ship something really quick you know in like a week it feels really amazing but then you go and you look at your goals and you look at your metrics and they're flat or they're slow and you're like oh okay all those little tiny swings weren't kind of having the impact we want but then on the other flip side when you're spending weeks months sometimes quarters doing a giant game-changing experience from end to end and you're pulling in all these partners Sometimes it can be frustrating because you're you're seeing your goals set or you know this is going to be impactful, but it feels like it's taking so long to build. And so how do you balance those things? And one thing that's been helpful for me to reference or think about is uh, just building a portfolio of bets. And one of my favorite tools for that is something I've called the barbell strategy, which is kind of if you imagine a barbell, right, which is super skinny in the middle and then super fat on both ends, we have like these big weights. That's how I tend to think about my portfolio um, that I'm building with my team across quick wins and what I call big swings. So a quick win is something that you can do in you know hours, days, it's small, it's low risk, not necessarily low time, but you're pretty sure this is going to work. But it's probably not a whole new product. It's not a whole new feature. It's not a whole new giant risky thing. It may just be a, a small optimization, a small quality of life enhancement, a small natural add-on or evolution of what's already working. And those are great. You need those. They build morale. They show the team that you have momentum. And your customers appreciate it too. They like to see progress and that you're moving fast. Sometimes they surprise you with how impactful they are. Sometimes you expect it to move things by a couple points, but it actually moves it by a lot more and you're able to kind of lean into it. But I think you have to temper that and balance that around these bigger swings where you're really stepping back and looking at the end-to-end -end experience and trying something that may require more discovery, that may have more risk, that may require pulling in efforts and coordinating across the team. It may end up being a, a kind of a company level experience that you're building out. And a lot of the most successful things that our team worked on at Coda were kind of a combination of both. We had quick wins that kind of worked as stepping stones or help us validate certain things or learn in the right direction. And then once that worked, we loaded up a bunch of resources and built out a bigger experience or doubled and tripled down on it. And the combination of those things can work really, really well when you're constantly learning. Yeah. It's interesting to dive into that and especially into your journey, working on the activation part of the product, which is to be honest, one of the most complex parts in any product to move the needle in. And you had this interesting case study also on your website about the welcome doc onboarding that also helped you increase the activation, if I'm not mistaken, by 60% with the team. And I'm wondering if you could tell more about your initial approach to defining activation maybe first. And what did you learn from that? Totally. One thing that I used to fall into a trap, if you will, earlier in my career was just kind of looking at all these SaaS companies and saying, man, it seems like there's one way to do onboarding. It seems like there's best practices and you can just roll in and do a lot of these things. And to an extent, that's kind of true. But more than that, each product is different. Each business is different, even if they look similar, right? If you're building onboarding for Coda or for Notion or for some other document product, each of those is going to be different because the business is different. The product is different. They're at different stages. They have different strategies. So you can't just blindly copy paste. And so there's a few things or questions that I ask myself when I'm coming in with the team to make sure we understand kind of the experience we're trying to create and then kind of stepping back and working backwards from that, we create a great onboarding experience that tees you up and sends the users in the right direction. The first one uh, is just, do you understand the game you're playing? And what I mean by that is there's different products have different outcomes, right? If I'm playing kind of a game for fun on my phone or with friends, spending lots of time in that app may be a really, really good thing. I want to play a first game, a second game, a third game. I'm having fun. And because spending time and just kind of, you know, having fun is the main point of that. But if you're using something like code or something to solve a problem, spending lots of time in the app may actually be the opposite of what you want. Maybe you want to get in and get out. Maybe the goal is to make you more productive. Again, is it a single player game or is it a multiplayer game, right? If you're playing this with other people, you're going to have a whole set of different things about 
it's not just do I find it intuitive or do I solve a problem, but I've got to use it with my team. It's kind of scary to share it with that team. There's other people who might have to like use it in different ways. I might have to set up way more things. So really understand the game you're playing helps you measure the right objects, right? Are we activating a user or are we activating teams? Or is this more of a, a service that we're building together? And actually there aren't even end users per se, but we're you know, measuring uptime or we're measuring, you know, different things that we're syncing or sending between different services. Is it a marketplace where we're kind of measuring how many people are using it on two sides? And so understanding that will help snap a lot of things into focus and ask, help your team ask the right questions. And by experience, the other thing I found is, is sometimes it's easy to hop right into metrics and just start throwing things out. Well, what about retention? What about revenue? What about this thing? But especially when you're defining activation, which I agree is so insanely slippery, I found it actually easier to start with a story and start with, can you describe if you had a camera trained over the shoulder of your users sitting at their desk, sitting at their laptop, at home with their coffee, whatever they're doing, what are they going to do first, second, third, when they're successful or when they're having a really rough, frustrating time using your product on their own? And as you go through that, you may find one moment that I kind of think of as the epicenter, right? It's that moment where if you remove that, depending on how they interact at that moment, they're either going to go down a successful path and have an amazing time and build a habit and, and start paying you and getting having a really great time, or they're going to start spiraling and spinning their wheels or getting frustrated or, or kind of doing things that they didn't want to do. So if you can understand that, the story and then the most important step in that, it can be really helpful to work backwards to define the most important inputs and outputs that your team actually cares about and have a really focused conversation. One example I heard from Figma, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it makes a ton of sense to me, is that when they were figuring out at one point with their product-led growth team, the moment that they were trying to drive teams towards to activate, they settled on one specific moment that was basically the first moment that you see another teammate's cursor in your doc. Like that's the moment we're driving towards. And I love that example because it's a great example of an epicenter moment where there's so many inputs that have to go into that, right? For a multiplayer product like Figma, where you have to sign up, you have to create a team. You have to create a board. You have to do things at the board. You have to invite someone else. They have to sign up. They have to get it. They have to figure out how to navigate around. And then finally, you get this moment. And you don't have to spell all those things out because it's just one almost like crystal clear picture. Oh, when you see that second cursor, that's the aha moment. That's the moment. That's the epicenter that we're kind of guiding towards. Whoa. I really loved your storytelling about like the way how you need to put yourselves in the shoes of a user and actually emphasize, deeply emphasize on all the steps they're going through inside the product to find this actual moment. And I'm wondering if you had any user behavior insights that influenced the definition of activation at Quota and what were these behavioral insights? Yeah, I, tons of little ones. I wouldn't say there was any one moment where it's like, oh, this was the perfect interview, the perfect study, the perfect survey. But what I will say is I don't think there's any substitute for getting regular, direct, unfiltered feedback from the people who are buying your tool, the people who are using your tool. And one thing that I found, uh, I set up a lot of feedback systems. And that's one of the things I show off on my website. It's one of the things I love kind of geeking out about is how you can collect feedback, get more efficient about it, be more thoughtful and curious and intentional with your users. But oftentimes what I find is when you talk to users who are already activated or already paying or already deep using your product, there are many things that may be obvious to them, right? Or so natural for them to rave about it, that they love about your product. For Coda, for example, it might be that, oh, some of the integrations that I'm using after, you know, two, three, four months are so great. Or, wow, it's actually so cheap. Once we started paying, I didn't understand how your billing worked, but this is so obvious now that I understand how it works. But if you go and talk to a new user who just hit your homepage or who just signed up on their first day, what are the things that your most passionate fans and users know and seems absolutely obvious to them, but is totally flying by and going over the heads 
of your new users, right? And if you can understand some of those things, it might be an opportunity for you to kind of put them on a fast track that pulls forward some of the things that are obvious to users, you know, six weeks or six months in and help them get it in six minutes instead. And if you can do that, a lot of times, those are some of the most exciting wins or insights that you can kind of build around. And I think every experience has that, right? But the trick is sometimes if you're not talking to those users after uh, they've kind of gotten deep into the product and asked them the right questions, it can be hard to find them. It's kind of like a scavenger hunt. Wow, yeah. I love this focus on user a lot in your uh, talking. And I also think I was reflecting on that topic as well myself. And I was thinking about adding healthy friction into this activation flows and the importance of that, because it also helps to stimulate these investment loops into the product, not just simplify everything, remove all of this friction, but probably users who invested more time into Coda, into building the doc, into organizing all of that they became more engaged if they did that successfully. I'm wondering that I noticed that you experimented on this area of welcome docs a lot and you iterated a lot on one area. And why did you do that? And why didn't you shift to other directions immediately? What was your thinking behind just iterating on this particular solution? Yeah, it's always... A balance. And you never know for sure 100%. But one bright spot that we were seeing or that any team can see is kind of what's already working or what's successful right now. And in our case, we could see some things that were happening in the high touch onboarding scenarios, right? Maybe uh, at the time we were kind of newer to building out cell serve onboarding, or there was just a lot of things that were new opportunities. But there were maybe, you know, customer success managers or sales team that were explaining the product on Zoom calls, on sales calls, on training calls, on webinars. And you can kind of see people's eyes light up for certain things. You can see, oh, when we use this example, maybe things went really well. Or when people tried to just hop in directly, they really flailed in different ways. And so seeing some of the things that really worked of understanding the product in context, focusing on certain integrations or features can be really, really helpful. And so looking at what was working and saying, okay, there is a kernel of something that is already working. How can we break that down to scale it and kind of de-risk it and build it into a new, more scaled self-serve onboarding experience? Some of the things we looked at for Welcome Doc specifically, which is basically just in the past, right? It, it can be very easy with a product like Coda to just hop right into setting up a doc. But even though Coda is you know, a doc and that seems very familiar, and it is, Coda isn't a doc like a Google Doc or a Word Doc that you might have used, it basically has a no-code app builder built in, which means you can build almost anything for almost anyone, which is insanely broad, right? There's so much you can do with that. It can be really overwhelming. You kind of get this blank page paralysis where it's kind of like you go to a restaurant and sometimes they just have this thick giant menu they bring out with like a hundred items and you're you're kind of freaking out and going, oh no, what if I pick the wrong thing? Even though everything looks good, I'm just overwhelmed by so many choices. And so narrowing that down to a few things we thought would be great and explaining it in context could be really great, like it was happening in sales calls, but we had to break that down into different things. So one of our experiments was really just around discovery. How do we help minimize distractions and help surface any kind of doc early in the onboarding experience when maybe that isn't happening right now. What are some of the right ways to do that? What are some of the wrong ways to do that? So we did several iterations there to kind of fine tune how and when and for whom we were surfacing uh, any kind of doc. But then there's also the content, right? So we tested, I think, must have been dozens of versions internally and externally with users where we tried different types of content, explaining different orders, where we tried different features, where we tried different examples, where we tried removing the case studies, adding the case studies, what combination works really well. And we learned a lot about uh, how to teach things in context, how to make things simple, but exciting, kind of put the pieces together. And then once you have some of those things together, again, they're kind of like stepping stones or building blocks that you can snap together. And all these small stepping stone experiments can kind of build towards uh, a bigger end-to-end -end experience where you can put together the discovery, put together the new content and kind of double down as something that's working. And then once it is working, right, maybe just on desktop or or just in a certain scenario for a certain persona, you can start to expand that into adjacent opportunities where, hey, can we bring this to mobile? 
Can we bring this to, you know, personal users? Can we bring this to other scenarios, even if you started out with just desktop business users? Yeah, a lot of things resonated, actually. You also reminded me about this Hicks law, which is actually, if you have a lot of options, the time and effort to make a decision is like way bigger. And sometimes I heard from companies and people like, let's remove all onboarding at all. Let's just show the user everything. And I think it can be quite difficult for products that are horizontal, like Coda, and for users in these products, because it's insane how many things you can do there. But I also remember that for products which have this enormous amount of use cases, templates can be quite an interesting tr strategy and helping users figure out what to do with templates, through templates, through personalized templates can be quite impactful. What do you think about that? Maybe through the lens of code and through the lens of any horizontal product, uh, do you see value in templates to drive activation? I think they can be, but I think it really depends on your product. It depends on your user. One thing that was very tricky about a builder product like Kodo or like a website builder like Squarespace or Webflow might be another example, is some products, the persona or the target user that you're really focused on is very specific, right? At my current company, I'm focused on real estate marketing. And that's very specific, right? Someone who's marketing apartments is very specific. They have a very specific set of goals and needs that I understand, even if you're doing a broad set of things like project management or documentation or setting goals, you can kind of narrow that down. On the other side, some products like Figma are very focused on solving a specific problem. We'll design collaboration. I can use that across dozens of different industries, but the way that shapes up in the self-serve experience may have many common links or commonalities or examples of how you do that. What's tricky about a builder product in many situations is you're both serving a little bit of everyone, all kinds of markets, broad, open, everyone uses docs. It's all over the world, right? Blinking cursor is like every laptop ever. <laughs> when you open up your browser, someone's going to use a doc or a spreadsheet or a presentation. But what's also tricky about a product like that is you can also build almost anything in Coda, right? You can take notes in it. You can build out uh, this incredible system or something that almost feels like an app. So when you can build almost everything for almost anyone, how do you narrow that down? And templates can be a great example of that where you can either take something obvious for that user if you know things about them. Again, injecting that friction. If I know that you are you know, working, if you're a designer and you're trying to collaborate for a very specific thing, I may be able to give you a template that helps you show you and jump you exactly to that thing that might take you weeks or hours to find otherwise. But I also think an underrated part of templates that a lot of people miss is just understanding templates as pattern matching or, or great inspiration, right? Because I think people want to imitate other successful people like them or, or glean ideas from them. They want to almost like window shop through different ideas and, and pluck different things that they can use to, to make their own life easier, more fun, better. I think that's one of the th reasons Reforge's artifacts program is, is really excited and I was excited to contribute it, is it's really exciting to see examples of people that I admire. Or I, I've followed their work and I want to see how you do a write-up. I want to see how you run an experiment. And it's not because, Kate, I'm going to run you know, a design workshop or an experiment exactly the same way you do, but there might be just one golden idea that I kind of borrow and kind of remix and, and apply to my own things. And I think templates are a lot of the same way, especially when you have incredibly creative, smart, influential people that are using your platform, how can you use that in, in templates or publishing? And Coda had a combination of both, which we we're really fortunate to do. But I think it's something that is generally underrated for onboarding. Uh, something that a lot of people could do more. Cool. Now, I would like to switch the topic a bit and talk about PM and designer collaboration. And for that, I would like to play a little game that I just came up with. Let's see how it goes. So in growth, we talk a lot about aha moment. Gamification, I love it. <laughs> so let's play a game. In growth, we talk a lot about aha moment. And I want to know, Matt, for you, when is this situation where you are working with a product designer and you have an aha moment? That moment where you say, oh, I want to work with that guy. Yeah. I mean, I think my favorite moment working with a design partner is when I kind of call it like a mind meld. And it's so hard to get to because it requires high levels of trust. It requires a lot of time working together. 
But the moment I realized that is when you lose track of who came up with which idea, right? You look at something you're building together and you lose track of which ideas were from the design partner, which one for, were from your end partner, which one you came up with. It's just an idea we came up with together. It's more about solving the problem and working through it. And those are some of my favorite moments because one of the things that I think has gone really well with the design partner relationships I've, I've had has been kind of having intentionally blurry lines between what the PM does and what the designer does. Now you can take that too far for sure. But I think what's great is when you can have enough trust and stellar communication to where, hey, designer, if you want to help me align the problem and like work through the requirements and work through really like setting the vision for this, absolutely, I want your help with that. And same thing on the design side, hey, as a product manager, if you can help me inject ideas and creativity and different approaches to the way we're designing the experience or kind of working through like how we're intentionally crafting like what people see and feel and interact with that's super magical because it, it but it requires low ego and requires a lot of trust and that can be really hard to cultivate and it's also different on each team or with uh, each person you're working with because different people are motivated by different things they're scared by different things they're excited by different things they're inspired by different things so the more you can understand that and kind of unlock that like free flow of ideas where you work through things of the better because a lot of times it isn't you know the first or second even the third idea that really breaks through sometimes it's the 99th and so being able to just get those iterations and those repetitions through and in, in free collaboration where you're not hurting each other's feelings and you're building on each other's ideas and kind of launching each other to new creative heights is really great but very hard to do um, and i'm still absolutely learning how to do that better yeah very good answer i wanted to talk about the creative process what do you do to lock creativity and on your team, kind of having more of a creative process to pull together, like working with the designer, having this partnership, as you mentioned, and, you know, give that space for the team to go for maybe maybe more broader and bigger initiatives rather, rather than being uh, optimized for, for optimizations or small wins. Totally. Yeah. Because sometimes it, it can feel like safe to fall back on those quick wins, but that's also... You can kind of, it's kind of like eating junk food if you do too much of it. Like it'd be like if you ate potato chips for every meal, that's all you ate. You'd, you'd get sick of it after a little bit. And I think that's kind of how it is with teams. If you're doing work that is maybe like, oh, it's like kind of chipping away at things, but it's not very creative or it's, we're not really proud of it. One lesson that I loved from Codas had a product lane that he always talked about. I think our CEO Shashir talked about this as well as building a cathedral, which is kind of this incredible vision for your product. Kind of the story they tell to explain that, there's a story about a man who was walking through this place where a cathedral was being built. And he talked to one of the workers and said, what do you do here? And the man responds, well, I am making bricks from clay and straw and all these things. And he goes to the person next to him and says, hey, what are you doing? He says, well, I take the bricks from this pile and I stack them in a row. And that's my job. And then he goes to the third person and asks them, hey, what are you doing here? And he says, oh, I'm building a cathedral. And that's kind of the moment when I think your team can understand what's going on and really unlock their creativity is when you don't just understand what's on your plate this week. You don't just understand what's in front of you, but you understand the long-term vision that you are you connect with and that you're proud of and that is crystal clear. And that's going to motivate make you feel like an owner in a way that if you just understand, oh, my job is to hand over, you know, a spec to the engineer so that we can hit this launch milestone so that we can hit our goal. You know, that's not actually the total point, right? The goal is to have this thing that you can latch onto and understand completely and that connects with you. And that requires a lot of things, but a couple foundational things that I, I think can help with this. One, Kind of like we talked about earlier, I don't think there's a substitute for regular, direct, intentional feedback from your users and customers. So that can help if you have this cathedral vision where it's really clear how everything you're doing ladders up to this incredible end-to-end -end experience that you understand. I love injecting that and bringing partners along, whether you're from marketing, sales, support, you know, engineering, design, 
either bringing that to you in an easily digestible form where you can have that in mind as we're working through a problem together and building out the experience is great. And there's also exercises you can do and, and you can find your own spin on this that is kind of rip on your culture. Sometimes doing walkthroughs can be great. Sometimes different workshops or exercises can be great. Kind of one of the prompts I love using, I, I stole from Airbnb's founder, Brian Chesky. Um, if you've heard, have you, Oscar, have you heard of like the 11 star experience that he likes to walk through? No, I haven't. Oh, I love this example. So, so the 11 star experience is kind of this exercise where if you imagine like if you're as a new traveler staying in an Airbnb for the first time, what's like the one star experience out of 10 stars, like the worst possible experience you could have. And then 10 star, what's the best possible experience you could have. Then if you kind of went beyond that to something that is unreal and almost unattainable, what would that look like? So maybe a one star is you show up to the Airbnb, you can't get inside, it's cold, you're wet, you're cranky, it's late, you get inside, it's all dirty, it's not even, doesn't even match the pictures, right? You have all these fees that were confusing. It's just like an awful experience for like, I wish I just stayed home, right? Maybe a five star or somewhere in the middle where it's like, oh, it was fine, it kind of looks like what I wanted wasn't really great, wasn't really terrible. Maybe 10 star is like, oh, they have my favorite drink on the counter when I get in. Oh, wow. Everything is even better than I thought. Oh, all the amenities are perfect. I wasn't surprised by anything. And maybe 11 star experience is like, I was glided, you know, to the Airbnb, like on the backs of like cheering fans in a parade. Like my favorite band is inside, like welcoming me there. They have just, like this incredible local tour guide who spears me around to like have all these incredible experiences that I didn't even know to ask for it. Right. And so it's kind of this exercise of like, can we get a range of experiences that kind of revolve around the vision or, or the kind of the experience we're trying to craft in and out of the product? And then can we kind of go to the extreme goods and bads to kind of dial back to something and calibrate to something that we might be able to ship in a faster, more clear time period, which I always think is a great little tool or exercise to have in the toolbox especially when you're just trying to design an experience with lots of moving parts. This is super interesting example. And I love that, like you as a product manager, sharing it that way and Brian Chesky is also building that culture. Because I think sometimes my personal, maybe experience and feedback to the situation when PM and design partnership didn't work well is when the business person or product manager is speaking only through the lens of the business. Like this is a task. This is what we need to ship. This is the metric we need to move, not through the lens of the actual end result, user experience, emotions, and these deliverables, how to create this delightful experience that is exceeding expectations. And maybe like what I'm observing right now in the industry that there is still like a little bit of tension between product function and design function. And I'm wondering what did you find as a way to build more healthy partnership. And you referenced a lot this being closer to end users. Maybe this is a bridge that can, you know, connect both design and product people. And maybe you can give an example of these uh, rituals uh, or things that helped you build these healthy partnerships in the end. Yeah, I think this happens a lot with not just product and design, but all kinds of, you know, it happened with sales and marketing too, right? Uh, well, like, okay, if revenue is down, well, is it that, you know, we're not getting enough leads or, well, you're not just converting the leads, we're sending you. And it can be kind of uh, like butting heads. But I think in the best relationships, especially product and design, it's being able to find like where you have this overlap or like common values or like, we want the same thing. Hey, we both want to create an incredible experience end to end that is impactful for the user, but also if you trickle down, is impactful for the business and for revenue and all those other things first, right? And so it doesn't have to be, you know, kind of this tug of war between these two things or like someone has to win. But a few like hot spots that I've seen tend to flare up or I've seen in my experience is one, just misunderstanding what motivates each other, right? Again, Kate, if you're driven by craft and I'm driven by impact, can we understand like, hey, a great experience can allow us to flex our craft and like create something we're really proud of to ship and we can spend the time to get it right. But that's also going to move metrics and we can keep that in mind when we're designing different things, right? Another thing I see a lot is, especially when you're working on growth, it can be tempting to try and do everything all at once, all the time. Well, let's also update our monetization model and let's do some acquisition work and let's work on activation and, you know, let's throw in some referrals and, you know, 
these bug fixes and core product things really need to be fixed. But if you try to do all of that, that's an insane amount of context switching. And you may end up shipping a lot of things, but will they actually move the needle as much as if you say, okay, we're just focusing on onboarding just for this type of user, just at this one key step. And let's do that really, really well. And if we do that well, is can we focus on the highest point of leverage where if we get this right, it's going to make everything else easier, better, and kind of more streamlined. And we can kind of use this as a jumping off point to continue creating an incredible experience rather than just maybe kind of churning through a bunch of stories or features or whatever you're tracking. And I think the last thing that we touched on a little bit is like embracing the mind meld, right? So instead of it being like, well, you know, design has to win this decision or product has to win this decision or, you know, oh, you know, I am the product manager. So when I say it goes, can you embrace the mind meld where it's like, oh, we don't even know whose ideas came up with, but like, this is something we all believe in that we all feel really proud of that we're all behind. And also one thing I've, I found helpful is like embrace the long term, right? When you look back, you know, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now on the working relationship you had with your design partner, do you want it to, to be something where it's like, oh, well, I got my way? Or do you want to have something where, hey, Kate and I had an incredible collaboration and partnership and like we still keep in touch and we still like love sharing ideas and being curious together to this day, like play long term games with long term people. Right. And if you if you approach it from that attitude, I think you're going to get better results, have higher trust, have more of that mind meld and ultimately just have more stories about work you're proud of than if you just kind of focus on what's in front of you and just tunnel vision, ship this at all costs, you know, get my way at all costs. I don't think that's sustainable or fun, honestly, in the long term. Oh, I really love that. And I have a lot of examples of these things in my life right now as I left Mira. And I think plus one to the fact that we could work together very well, Matt, even after this 45 minutes conversation, I feel that we could work very well together. But I definitely believe the role of a product manager, and there are a lot of like debates right now, what is the role of product management, how we can modify, should we replace product managers, all of that. But I believe the biggest job of product manager is also building healthy team dynamics. And it's very tough. It's very tough. And I respect this job. I respect this profession. If this would be just the only thing to do, if AI will replace everything in the world, this is still tough. This is still very important. And product manager is doing that through the cross-functional group, like understanding all of these people, designers, engineers, marketers, understanding their intentions, their motivations. It's very tough. So I have a lot of respect to that. And just to finalize, that I also believe long-term game is very important. This is why we're building this podcast with Oscar after working together for three years. I'm also doing a project right now with the actual, like with my friend, with my best friend who was first growth PM at Mira. <laughs> and we worked for five years together and now we are still working and we are friends. And I really believe it's super powerful. If you build these healthy partnerships at work, it can become your lifelong friendships. So I just love it. Anyways, Matt, I think it was a very interesting conversation and you shared a lot of beautiful examples. And I wanted to finish up with uh, some lightning round as a tradition here. So we will ask you some questions. Don't think about just answer whatever is on your mind. So first we talked a lot about artifacts. Uh, what is your favorite artifact for the growth team? That is not yours because people can find all your artifacts on your website. Yeah, so many. One that I find myself using over and over again that just brings me joy is called $100 Voting. So you can use it in Coda. I'll share the link. But if you've ever been in a conversation where you're kind of going around a Zoom call and just asking, well, you know, which ideas do you think are most important? Which problems do you think are most important? What are your ideas? And you're just kind of talking out loud and synthesizing. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this took like an hour. This can take that hour and condense it down to a fraction of that. And it's basically an exercise where you get $100 kind of like in a spreadsheet as interact with Coda. And just by like listing a bunch of ideas, again, you can get this from the whole team. So you can do this ahead of time and have everyone add ideas from engineering, design, marketers, customers, whatever you need. But then you only have a finite number of dollars. 
And so you have to pick which am I going to put, you know, $99 behind one big ideas I'm super confident in. Am I going to spread it thin and put five bucks in a bunch of different ideas? Or usually what happens is people kind of put a lot of money behind, you know, the couple ideas they feel most passionate about. But you'll see some other things float up because a lot of people have it as kind of their fourth or fifth idea. And so it can be a great way to get a sense from different teams, different stakeholders, or even your own team. And it sparks a great conversation because then you have just this almost like budget of ideas that you can go through and you can use that to spark conversations, have trade-offs and really have that more creative collaborative conversation in a much faster time, which just makes it almost fun to do prioritization. The most fun uh, that I've had has been using an exercise like that. And it also educates uh, all of us to think through the lens of money and return on investment. Sometimes we forget about that when we are prioritizing our initiatives, like how much it really costs, like how much effort, how much money it will cost the company. And we need to think back sometimes. Very nice. We will share the link uh, in description. The second lightning question, uh, what is your favorite book for building healthy or just nice, creative, empowering team culture? Ooh, okay. I'll cheat and share a few runner-ups. One, if it's a standard one, but if you've ever really absorbed Radical Candor by Kim Scott, absolutely transformative for the way you give and receive feedback, at least in my experience. Another one that's just fun, if you want to just understand people you might understand, especially working in tech, just understanding, I think it's Managing Humans by Michael Lopp, which is just tons of experiences from someone who's worked as an engineering manager at like Apple, Slack, just tons of different companies. And so it's kind of fun to, to hear those stories from someone who's been in the tech industry for decades. But probably my favorite book for this is not from tech at all, but it's from Danny Meyer called Setting the Table, which is about the restaurant and service industry. And he shares tons of great examples about hiring, about service, about hospitality, about how to build your team. And one of my favorite examples from that to share a quick snippet is he talks about when someone on your team becomes a manager, there's this like hidden shift that happens that I think about all the time. And he says kind of three big things happen when you become a manager. One, you basically have like a megaphone like attached to your mouth where like everything you say gets heard by 20 times more people right? You also, everyone on your team kind of gets binoculars and they're like watching what you do as a leader in the company much more carefully and really studying what you say, how you say it, every little thing that's happening. And then he also talks about how you kind of get like the gift of fire in these different ways. And what does fire mean? It means, well, fire can do a lot of things, right? It can be productive. You can use it as a bonfire to rally people around you. You can use it as a torch to educate and light the way. But it could also have this other side where it can singe people, right? And sometimes you need that, right? To maintain integrity or to really say, hey, something's not okay, or like we need to adjust something. But if you're irresponsible with it, it can also kind of run away from you and hurt people or burn people. And you got to be really, really thoughtful as a leader about how you're engaging and the decisions you're making and, and what you say and how you say it. So tons of examples, even though it's not in tech, I think sometimes some of the best examples are, are kind of from outside the industry. So I highly recommend checking it out. Oh, yes. We will put these links in our description. And I definitely agree that, you know, inspiration is everywhere and also outside the box <laughs> of tech. And finally, where folks and our listeners can find you to connect, to ask you questions. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter, just Matt Woods. You can also find my website at mattwoods.io and happy to connect, answer questions or help out if I can. Absolutely. We will attach all these links and your beautiful website and artifacts. And it was very insightful and useful conversation. You shared a lot of examples and we really appreciate that. Thanks for being with us today. Thanks, Kate. Oscar, it was a delight. We'll have to do it again soon. Yes, please. Yeah, wonderful. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Matt. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Enjoy. Thank you for listening. If you found it valuable, you can support Growth Mates by sharing this episode with your friends and colleagues. Subscribe to our show on your favorite platforms and get all episodes to your inbox by subscribing to katesuma.substack.com. Let's keep growing together.